As the Orioles go through spring training, they continue to look to add depth to this team. And they did that with two moves earlier this week, bringing in two veterans, Julio Tehran and Colton Wong, on minor league deals. But can either of these vets make the Orioles opening day roster and make an impact with the O's in 2024? We'll answer that question coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Thursday, February 29th, 2024, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. A happy leap day, only coming once every four years, and do apologize for uh, kind of leaping around a little bit with the podcast recording schedule. We are back here on a Thursday evening, and coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, we're going to talk about some roster moves from the Orioles. They brought in two interesting veterans this week on minor league deals. One, the starting pitcher, Julio Tehran, who was an all-star multiple times with the Braves, and one, the second baseman, Colton Wong, who's been around baseball for a while and won a couple of gold gloves. I think both of them have a chance to make the Orioles opening day roster, but can they? We'll kind of dive through their past, their last few years, the Orioles roster, and what their chances are, and that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. So let's start with Julio Tehran. I would say maybe at this point in twenty twenty four, to the average baseball fan, he's probably the lesser known name of the two between Tehran and, and Colton Wong sound off in the YouTube comments to let me know who is a little more well-known at this point but the Orioles brought in earlier this week Julio Tehran on a minor league deal now as many minor league deals do this one of course has a non-roster invite he will be in big league spring training with the Orioles he is actually already there through his first bullpen session in Sarasota on Thursday and it looks like he's most likely going to pitch in a game in spring training at some point this weekend for the O's but he is in big league camp. He is fighting for a job. And it also has an opt-out. Now, most guys get this opt-out when they've accrued this much service time and have been in the big leagues for as long as Tehran has. But Andy Martino, actually of SNY, Martino, who mostly covers the New York Mets, had really good reporting on this signing and a story on Wednesday because the Mets were apparently also strongly pursuing Julio Tehran and wanted to bring him into camp as well. But the reason the Orioles got him is, A, they gave him an opt-out of March 25th, which is three days before opening day. And the reason why that is enticing is that that would give Tehran time if he does not make the Orioles opening day roster. He could opt out that day and still have time to sign with another team before opening day on March 28th and still be on somebody's roster. So that's enticing. And the other one is the signing bonus that the Orioles gave to Julio Tehran. Now, most of the time in these minor league deals, you get a little bit of cash. You get you know the amount of cash that a AAA player is making. Maybe you add on a little bit more to get a, a former big league player. But the Orioles gave Julio Tehran $100,000 as his signing bonus. Now, as major league contracts go, that is nothing. But in the world of minor league deals, it's, according to Martino, a fairly rare number, a very high number in terms of a minor league deal signing bonus. So the Orioles... With in a roundabout way, with you know, John Angelo's technically still the controlling person here, outbid another team technically, technically on the smallest level for a free agent. Apparently, the Mets weren't willing to offer that much of a signing bonus, even though the Mets thought that they were going to be able to sign him, according to that story by Andy Martino. And then, if Tehran does make the team for the O's, he will get two million dollars in 2024 if he does make the Orioles opening day roster. Now, what this tells me is the Orioles think they may need him. If they were willing to outbid another team on a signing bonus for a minor league deal, they feel they really might need this right-hander either in the rotation or in the bullpen. But the last part of Andy Martino's story was if Julio Tehran opts out, doesn't make the Orioles roster, the Mets want him. And he's probably going to end up a Met if he doesn't make this Orioles opening day roster. So it kind of works out well for him. Now, who who is Julio Tehran? Because if you're a newer baseball fan, if maybe you don't watch a lot of National League baseball, whatever it may be, you may not know who this is. Well, Julio Tehran is a 33-year-old right-handed pitcher 
who debuted in the big leagues a long time ago. He was 20 or 21 years old when he made his debut with the Atlanta Braves all the way back in 2011, a very highly touted pitching prospect at the time. He came up and honestly, he had an awesome nine-year stint with the Atlanta Braves. Basically spent nine straight years in their rotation, made 226 starts, and posted a 3.67 ERA in that stretch with the Braves. He made two all-star teams in 2014 and 2016, and he set the Braves record. This is a team with a rich history, especially in the 80s and 90s of starting pitching. He set the Braves record by making six consecutive opening day starts. From 2014 to 2019, the Braves opening day starter every single year was Julio Tehran. I mean, he was never, you know, a Cy Young level guy. And again, only two all-star teams, but he was just a really solid to good major league starting pitcher for a long time. But his stuff started to come down a little bit. The velocity was dropping, wasn't as many strikeouts in those last couple of years with the Braves. So when he became a free agent after the 2019 season, the Braves were kind of starting to really turn the corner and how good they were about to get. They decided to not bring back Julio Tehran. He signed a one-year deal in free agency with the Angels. Of course, we had the weird 2020 season, and he was really bad in 2020. He had a little bit of an injury. He got COVID that year. There was the weird season. He only made 10 starts, and he was bad with the Angels. So then he, he signed a deal with the Tigers the next offseason and was just trying to reset on that year. Well, that is when the injuries hit him. And it seemed like he might have been dealing with smaller injuries before then because the stuff had started dropping off so much. But he got a shoulder injury in April of 2021 with the Tigers after making, I believe, just one or two starts with Detroit before that injury. That is an injury that you could argue for pitchers in this day and age is worse than an elbow injury is something that happens to your shoulder. Because when you, if you can make it back from that injury, usually velocity is zapped and your just ability is zapped much more than with the elbow, at least generally for pitchers in 2024. So he gets the shoulder injury. He gets ruled out at one point for the rest of the year, basically misses the entire 2021 season. And then he's kind of, you know, rehabbing, but teams are really unsure what he has and gets no major league interest in 2022 because of the injury. So he signs to pitch an independent ball and he pitched an indie ball and in the Mexican league during the 2022 season. He hopped on with the Padres in AAA in like September, right at the end of the year. But basically it was two years, 21 and 22 without pitching in the big leagues, but the Brewers brought him in as depth in spring training last year, and he ended up playing a little bit of a role for this Brewers team, which had a really big and really important top of the rotation, as we know, Corbin Burns, Brandon Woodruff, and Freddie Peralta, but those guys, those guys get their bumps and bruises, and the Brewers had some questions at the back end of the rotation, and Tehran last year was the answer to a few of their questions at one point a little bit into the season. He Ended up only making 11 starts with the Brewers, 14 appearances, because he did have a little bit of a hip issue in the middle part of the season, but returned to pitch a little bit in September as well. But he threw 71 and two-thirds innings for the Brewers in the major leagues last year, and he was just kind of okay. I mean, but that's kind of fine for a starter at this point. If you're a fill-in number five starter, if you can give a 4.40 ERA in about 72 innings, teams will take that as like their number six slash depth starter. Now, his strikeouts were way down from back in the day, only 17% strikeout rate, but only a 4% walk rate was one of the best numbers in all of baseball. He wasn't walking anybody, which the Brewers loved as well. And his stats weren't as good in AAA. He also threw about 57 AAA innings last year and had a 5.53 ERA, but got much more strikeouts and, you know, a few more walks, but not to a point where it was a concern at all for Tehran. But the big thing for Julio Tehran and, and why he did have some success, and really it was like those first, I think, five or six starts with the Brewers when they first added him to the roster. Like he was really good. He had a sub two ERA in those first few starts and then he started to struggle a little bit, but was still fine in that 11 start stretch and, and pitched out of the bullpen a little bit as well before they eventually DFA'd him right at the end of the season. But his stuff now, it's it's fairly different to what it was at his peak of, of being the ace of the Brave staff there for a while. I mean, his four-seam fastball is now averaging 89 miles per hour, and he's basically dropped that pitch. He was averaging 94 when he first came up with Atlanta, and he's given up on the four-seam fastball. He was throwing it less and less for the last couple of years, and he did not throw a single four-seam fastball in those outings he had in the month of September last year for the Brewers. Basically gave it up, and instead he changed his arm slot a little bit, and he started 
relying much heavier on a sinker, on a changeup, and a brand new cutter that he had never thrown before that he introduced in 2023 with Milwaukee. And he's still not throwing hard. The sinker is averaging like 90 miles per hour, but he's getting a solid amount of ground balls with that pitch. His curveball was always his best breaking ball. That pitch is still good. Doesn't throw it as much, but opponents hit just 074 against it in the big leagues last year with a 32% whiff rate. His new cutter is at about 86. Opponents hit just 219 against it last year. So He's got a solid sinker, changeup, cutter, curveball mix for him right now. And Stuff Plus, looking at just the raw data on the pitches, actually liked his pitches a fairly good amount in AAA. Didn't like them as much when he got to the big leagues with Milwaukee last year, but he was still a somewhat effective pitcher. And the Orioles don't need him to be their ace. They don't need him to be Atlanta Braves version of Julio Tehran, but they might need him at some point early in the season. And that's where we kind of finish on him here. Like, does he have a chance to make this Orioles opening day roster. Now, if he does, it would either be as the fifth starter or as the Orioles long reliever if they want one. And you know, the O's are in a weird place with their rotation right now. We know John Means, at the very least, is not going to be back for opening day because of the late start in spring training. My guess right now was would be we don't see John Means until May, so we're probably at least going about a month without John Means. And Kyle Bradish, I mean, he's continuing to throw from 90 feet, but it's nothing super high effort, and we just don't know, and it's a UCL tear, although it might be minor. Tommy John is still in the back of your minds, and I'm just working off the assumption at this point that Kyle Bradish is going to get Tommy John surgery at some point, is going to miss all of this year and some of 2025 as well. It, it may not happen. There's still a chance he pitches this year, but that's how you have to operate as a team as well to be ready for that in case that's the case. So with the two of them out, you know, we talked about how Tyler Wells and Cole Irvin would fill into those fourth and fifth starter spots with Burns, Rodriguez, and Kramer as the Orioles' top three. But the O's are in an interesting spot. You know, if they wanted to, they would only need four starting pitchers for like the first two weeks, two and a half weeks of the season. Because they have so many off days built in right at the beginning of the year, the Orioles would not theoretically need a number five starter until April 16th. That's more than two weeks after opening day. And it's just because if you kept everybody on regular rest, you could go one, two, three, four, and then back to one because you have off days built in there. Now you may want to give guys extra rest anyway, if you can at the beginning of the season. So the Orioles most likely will still go with a five man rotation, but it's a possibility they could go four starters and throw Tyler Wells in the bullpen. It's also a possibility that they feel John Means will be okay when he comes back, but they're going to be without him for a month, and they like to have some depth because if you're going to go at least a month without Means and Bradish, you're looking at that top five, which still feeling okay, right? About Burns, Rodriguez, Kramer, Irvin, and Wells. But what do you have behind it? If you have any kind of injury, anybody starts to struggle, you kind of have nothing. I mean, yes, I think Chase McDermott, and Cade Povich and Justin Armbruster, who John Mioli wrote a good story about in the Baltimore Banner the other day that you should go read. Like they all have a lot of promise and they could all help the Orioles in 2024. But this has been written about and reported, and Brandon Hyde has flat out said it. He believes all three of those guys are still going to start this season in AAA. They are not options, I don't think, although they're all in big league camp, they're not options for opening day for the O's. So the other starting depth for the Orioles is like the guys they brought in on minor league deals, like Andrew Suarez and Albert Suarez and, and those guys. And then Jonathan Heasley, who you brought over from the Royals. And then Bruce Zimmerman is in there as well, who's coming back from core surgery in the offseason. And as much as I love Bruce Zimmerman and, you know, Jonathan Heasley could be interesting, you don't feel great with those guys at the depth. When they were the eighth and ninth starters, you were like, okay, this feels good. When they're now the sixth and seventh starters, you're in a much different spot. So even if Julio Tehran is just your sixth starter, that gives you much better depth because what he can do, he can force ground balls. He talked to the Orioles media on Thursday, said when he was facing hitters in winter ball this year, they were telling him that his stuff looks completely different with the new arsenal, the slightly different arm slot as well, that he looks much better than he did the last couple of years. Those are all good things for Tehran, and we'll see what he can do, but maybe if Julio Tehran, you feel like he's good enough when you watch him in spring training, maybe he's your number five starter with Irvin as your number four. And maybe you just put Tyler Wells into the bullpen from the start of the year. And he's still able to give you some length out of the pen if you need it. But it strengthens that bullpen, which initially had lost Tyler Wells and might have been even more of a question mark. There's plenty of question marks in the O's bullpen right now. 
There's also question marks about, you know, if it's Irvin and Wells, the four and five starters, like it's not just who is the depth, but who is the long reliever? Like, do you want to carry a long reliever? Do you want to carry Jonathan Heasley or Bruce Zimmerman on the opening day roster to be your long man? I think at worst, if you want to carry a long man, it could be Julio Tehran. I think he is going to be better in the big leagues this year if you give him innings than Heasley or Zimmerman. So at the very least, with a minor league signing right now, the Orioles got a little bit better. And they do have plenty of bullpen options. Now, they don't have as much depth in terms of really, really quality depth. They have a lot of options where they can put together an eight-man bullpen with guys that can get major league hitters out. But none of the guys they really have, except for Heasley and Zimmerman, are long relievers. And if you were to rank all the Orioles' bullpen options in terms of just pure talent, pure stuff, pure ability to get guys out at the big league level, Heasley and Zimmerman would be at the top of the list if you ranked them by ability to give you length but they would probably be right at the bottom in terms of just talent level and stuff. So that's the weird spot the O's are in. Do you want a long man just in case, or do you want to go with the eight best pitchers in the bullpen and maybe them all be guys who can mostly only go one inning at a time? It's an interesting question. So if the O's feel they want a long man, I think Julio Tehran, even if it's him, is a better option than Zimmerman or Heasley, or he's a fine option being the number five and Tyler Wells going back in the bullpen. I'm okay with that too. It's not going to be this big strikeout stuff that it was at one time, but low walks, he's going to keep the ball on the ground, which is nice as well. And you know what? If he gets a rotation spot or gets a bullpen spot and he's still pitching well, whenever John Means returns in May, if he's pitching well, you will find a way to keep him on the roster. He's a veteran who's been around. He's been on winning teams. He's been teammates with Craig Kimbrell. He's, of course, been managed by Freddie Gonzalez when he was in Atlanta and Gonzalez was the manager there. So he's got connections to this Orioles team already. I like this signing, and I honestly think at this point, there's at least like a 30% chance and maybe higher that Julio Tehran just makes the Orioles opening day roster. And so if you look at it like that, he makes this team better at this point. Now, will he be an O for the entire season? I highly doubt he spends like most of the year on the Orioles roster, but he's going to help them early in the year when they need it before means and, and hopefully Bradish can come back. And it's all about adding to that depth. We question the Orioles' depth after the injuries. This helps to answer that question. But the O's also added more depth in terms of a minor league deal. And this one was added to an area where they didn't really need nearly as much depth. It's Colton Wong, because that's what the Orioles needed, another infielder in camp. We'll talk about why they made the move coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Game Time. Buying tickets to your favorite events, it just, it shouldn't be stressful. You shouldn't have to worry. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. They've got killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Now, I literally use the Game Time app. Last night, on Wednesday night, went to the Xfinity Center, watched the Terps lose to Northwestern, because they've done a lot of losing this year. That team is not very good at all. But I got my tickets about a month ago on game time, and I was literally walking into the arena and realized, oh yeah, I need to pull up my tickets. It took five seconds for me to open up the game time app, pull up the ticket, boom, get it scanned, and walk right into the arena. It's that easy, and they were still selling tickets to flash deals like 30 minutes before tip-off walking into the arena. I could have bought a ticket right there and gone in via game time. That is how easy they make it. So you can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On. That's L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So the Orioles made a pair of minor league signings this week. One was Julio Tehran, the veteran right-handed pitcher who could find himself in a spot in the Orioles rotation. And the other was Colton Wong, whose signing made a little less sense. Now, I will still preface this with something I've mentioned a lot of times so far this offseason, is that there is no such thing as a bad minor league deal. They are basically super low risk and in certain scenarios can be super high reward. 
You could sign 10, 15, 20, 30 players to minor league deals. It really doesn't matter. It gives you depth in camp. It gives you competition. Some of the guys stick with you in AAA to give you depth. It just helps the organization be better in spring training and throughout the season. But the Colton Wong one was interesting because if it was just your, your run-of-the-mill minor league deal for an infielder like someone like Errol Robinson, who the Orioles signed to a minor league deal earlier this offseason, had the game-tying hit and then scored the walk-off run in the Orioles' spring training win on Thursday. Like He's a guy who will not sniff, sniff the, the major leagues this year. He's like a solid speed bench option infield, outfield. He'll honestly be in Norfolk, might even spend some time in Bowie, just to give the O some depth. But Never going to make it to the bigs, but a nice depth signing. Colton Wong on a minor league deal is a little bit different because he's been in the big leagues, similar to Julio Tehran, for a long time. And his deal is similar to Julio Tehran's in that if Wong makes the opening day roster, it will be a one-year, $2 million contract for Colton Wong this season. Now, he will have an opt-out clause. If he does not make the opening day roster, he can opt out and become a free agent once again, which is automatic because of the service time he has accrued in Major League Baseball in his career. And if the Orioles want to keep him in the organization in AAA, even if he doesn't make the team, they can pay him $100,000 as a retention bonus to try and entice him to stick around. But who is Colton Wong? Well, just like Julio Tehran, he's 33 years old, except he's a position player. He's an infielder. He's pretty much exclusively a second baseman who hits from the left side. He, in his career, has played a lot of baseball. He played about 100 innings in the outfield with the Cardinals in 2016. Beyond that, basically every single inning of his big league career has been played defensively at second base. That is his position. That will continue to be his position. And he's been overall a solid second baseman. I mean, he won the gold glove in 2019 and 2020 in second base with the Cardinals. Gold gloves are never the greatest attribute of who was actually the best defender at that position in a given year, but he's always been known as a solid glove at second base, but he's had a, just a really solid career in the big leagues. He was a first round pick by the Cardinals in 2011 out of Hawaii, debuted with St. Louis in 2013 in the postseason that year, played in the World Series that year that they lost to Boston. And for eight years with the Cardinals, he was just a really solid piece of their lineup. 2013 to 2020 with St. Louis, over 850 games, was a 261 career hitter, about a 96 OPS plus. So right around a league average hitter for eight years with good defense at second base. Just a solid guy to have on the team. Had some pop at times, won the two gold gloves. But then he had kind of just run his course in St. Louis. They were bringing up a lot of young infielders, which the Cardinals did a couple of years ago. And Wong wasn't getting any better, so they just kind of let him walk in free agency. And interestingly enough, he signed on with a division rival, the Milwaukee Brewers, and kind of had a little bit of an offensive renaissance. He played two years with the Brewers in 2021 and 2022, and those were statistically the two best offensive seasons of his career. He stayed healthy. He combined to play 250 games in those two years. Not like he played every day, but he was a, a nice part of the, the Brewers Roster hit 262 and had a 113 OPS plus in those two seasons. He was a really good hitter, had a career high 15 homers in 2022, was a Silver Slugger Award finalist at second base that year. Like he looked like a different hitter. And the Seattle Mariners, once he became a free agent after the 2022 season, were very intrigued by the better hitter of Colton Wong. And after the Mariners had let their second baseman, Adam Frazier, walk and sign a one year deal with the Orioles, they said, you know what? Let's get this new and improved Colton Wong in free agency. He's going to upgrade from Adam Frazier. Well, it turned out while Adam Frazier was, I'll say, fine in an Orioles uniform at best, Wong was a disaster, and Seattle did not upgrade. He played 67 games for the Mariners last year and by far had the worst offensive stretch of his career. In 216 plate appearances with Seattle, Wong hit just 165 with a 241 on base and a 227 slugging. That was good for just a 35 WRC plus in the majors last year. And he struck out more than ever. His 21% strikeout rate, while not high in the grand scheme of things, was the highest of his career. Now, he was DFA'd by the Mariners and was eventually picked up by the Dodgers late in the season. And ho-hum, the Dodgers pick up a player, a veteran late in the year, and somehow make him better. Now, he didn't play much for the Dodgers. He only had 34 plate appearances down the stretch, but I believe they put him on the postseason roster. And again, it was only three, 34 plate appearances, but he did hit 300 in his time with the Dodgers because of course he did. I tend to look at the 200 plus plate appearances with Seattle and you start to worry a little bit. His chase rate jumped big time last year, started swinging at way more pitches out of the zone. 
His quality of contact was was down. It was never great. He was never a super hard hit exit velocity guy, but all of those numbers were down last year, as you can expect. And he really struggled catching up with velocity. Wong has always been a guy who had struggled against breaking balls, but it always hit the fastball so well. Like you go through his stats year by year in St. Louis and Milwaukee, and every single year he's hitting 280, 290, 300, 310 plus against fastballs. Like he had always dominated fastballs. Last year, he hit just 220 with a 297 slugging percentage against fastballs. That is really, really bad for Colton Wong. And so you start to wonder, like, okay, was the whole issue here, was it bat speed? Did he just lose bat speed because he was 32 years old and just body and, and game start to decline? That is the question. Is the real Colton Wong the offensive renaissance 2022 where he had his best career year? Or is it the disaster 2023 where it was his worst career year? That's a weird time into your 30s, have your best and then immediately your worst after having a 10-year big league career. Kind of odd for Colton Wong. So the Orioles wonder, can they fix his swing a bit? Can they get the bat speed back? Can he be a productive hitter once again? But the other question is, is there room for Colton Wong on this team? I mean, that's that's a big question as well. He's just another left-handed bat, another infielder that falls into this crazy infield mix. If you haven't gone back and listened to Tuesday's episode, I highly recommend it. I tried to answer the question, do the Orioles have too many left-handed hitters on this team and in camp? Ho-hum, here is another veteran left-handed hitter in Colton Wong trying to make the team. Now, if Jackson Holiday is on the Orioles opening day roster, there is just no space for Colton Wong. It's just not happening. But if the Orioles, for whatever reason, whether they think he needs more at-bats in AAA, whether they think he needs more time defensively at second base in AAA, had a nice triple in Thursday's game, whatever it is, if the Orioles decide to keep Holiday in AAA to begin the season, there is an opening for Colton Wong because Mike Elias has said it earlier this offseason that he would like a left-handed hitting second base option on this team. Now, the obvious answer to that is Jackson Holiday who, while he's a shortstop by trade, the Orioles have played him exclusively at second base this spring, and they're saying he's going to play second this year when he's in the big leagues. But if they don't want to start the year with Holiday and they still want that left-handed hitter, maybe it's Colton Wong. Nick Maton, who they acquired from the Tigers, is also in camp, also a left-handed hitting second baseman. Now, Wong has a much stronger just resume, more years of being solid to good, more experience in the big leagues, but Maton is younger. And although he had similar struggles offensively last year, is also more versatile. Maton can play the corner outfields as well, can play third base. Colton Wong is basically stuck at second base defensively. That's about it. So if Holiday is not on this roster, Colton Wong is in the mix. If Holiday is, it's a moot point, and he's just depth here and probably signs on with another team before the season really starts. But again, this starts to make you think that you know Jackson Holiday is not, and we've said this again and again, Jackson Holiday is not by any means a lock to make this opening day roster. There's going to be competition. There's going to be fallback options. And to go along with Nick Maton, Colton Wong is another veteran fallback option. And they always like these guys, Rugnet Odor, Adam Frazier. Wong could be a little better than both of those guys to just be a veteran option to have in the mix as a floor option, right? Like you don't want to fall too far down. If you can't go to Jackson Holiday or you feel you don't want to go to Jackson Holiday yet, Wong could be a short-term fix. But similar to Tehran, he could make the opening day roster. Highly doubt he spends, again, most of the 2024 season with the Orioles in the big leagues. But one more move to get to quickly coming up next. The Orioles lost a player off their 40-man roster this week. It was someone who we kind of felt at this point wasn't going to make the opening day roster. Anyway. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by FanDuel. You can get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 just if your bet wins. And you can bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. So as the Orioles brought in two veterans this week, Julio Tehran and Colton Wong on minor league deals, they also let go of a player as well as they placed Outfielder Sam Hilliard on waivers after kind of quietly DFAing him earlier in the week. Now, I'm sure the plan for the Orioles was to 
try and slip Hilliard through waivers, get him off the 40 man, keep him in triple a as outfield depth. The Orioles who had claimed Hilliard from the Braves back in November off waivers, a left-handed hitting outfielder who is a pretty good defender can play all three outfield positions. He's been a really good hitter and, and was a, a fairly highly regarded prospect all the way back in the day when he was in the Rocky system a few years ago. But when he came to the big leagues with the Rockies and then with the Braves, he just never could put it all together offensively. However, he had good defense, he had a good arm, and he could always show off the exit velocities, the batted ball data. It all looked good. He never put it together in the stat column, but everything felt like he was poised for a breakout at some point because the underlying data was so good. He either just never got enough of a chance or just never put it fully together at the big leagues. And while there was one point this offseason where I thought Hilliard had a solid chance to make the Orioles opening day roster as a fifth outfielder. As soon as we kind of realized, you know, the O's have a lot of lefties. They're now trying Jorge Mateo, trying to turn him into an outfielder. Jackson Holiday has more of a chance to make this roster on opening day. It just became clear that Sam Hilliard, his chance was not good to make this team. Again, I talked about it in Tuesday's episode. The Orioles already have a lot of lefties they're trying to squeeze in. I don't think they would want their fifth outfielder defensive replacement pinch hitter guy, Sam Hilliard, to also be a left-hander. They'd probably be look, looking for more of a right-hander in that role. And that's mostly why I felt he probably wasn't going to make the opening day roster. So they put him on waivers, and actually his old team, the Colorado Rockies, claimed him on waivers earlier this week. So he is back in Colorado with a much better chance over there of making a team's opening day roster. So good for Sam Hilliard. Hope he can get some big league time. But... It's interesting because the Orioles had a full 40-man roster before they made this move, and Tehran and Wong on minor league deals don't take up 40-man roster space. You don't have to make that move until you absolutely decide the day before opening day that you're going to put them on the opening day roster. Then you have to clear a spot on the 40-man. But there was no corresponding move. It's not like the Orioles made a waiver claim or made a trade or signed a free agent where they had to clear up space. They didn't have to. They just made this move. They cleared up a spot. And the Orioles now have 39 players on the 40-man roster with one open spot. Generally in spring training, you're usually only forced to make these moves. You don't kind of do them without the corresponding move. And we know the O's were going to have to clear this space at some point. And Sam Hilliard probably was going to be DFA'd again at some point this spring because I just don't think he was going to make the team. But it's interesting that they did it now, you know, about a month until opening day still. So maybe there's a move coming on the horizon. At some point, the O's want to add some more pitching, whatever it may be. Something to look out for, but an Orioles legend from November to February of an offseason, Sam Hilliard, he heads back to Colorado, and we'll see how they use that open 40-man roster spot. But that'll do it for today's episode. That'll also do it for the week on the podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in, sticking with me, being patient this week. I talked about it a little bit on Tuesday, but we as a podcast switched over producing and uploading platforms and so we had like it was just a reset on spotify and on apple Podcasts about the, the pod getting uploaded it came out later on monday one of the reasons why it came out later on tuesday and it's also just been a crazy week for me outside the podcast so because of that i've had more evening episodes instead of morning episodes and also because of that unless something huge breaks tomorrow this is most likely going to be just a three episode week this will be the last pod of the week but i will be back on monday and the good news is the Orioles play three, quote-unquote, televised spring training games this weekend. The game against the Braves Friday is on a Braves internet stream, which probably won't be like the full production value, but you'll at least get to see the game, which is better than we could say for Thursday's game when it was literally the last two number and picks facing off. You couldn't watch it anywhere. Then on Saturday, it's a Masson game against the Yankees, and guess what? Good reporting from Danielle Allentuck in the Baltimore Banner on Thursday – Mass and Comcast have at the very least extended their partnership while they are doing these negotiations to keep Masson on Xfinity. It was set to expire today on February 29th. It will now be extended into an unmentioned date sometime in March. So at the very least, Xfinity customers still should have Masson on Saturday when the O's play there. And then on Sunday, they are playing against the Pirates and the Pirates broadcast will have it broadcasted once again on Sunday. So we come back on Monday It'll kind of be like a regular season series. I'll have three spring training games to talk about because we'll actually see them. We'll get some stat cast data and we'll dive into everything I saw, everything I noticed from the weekend of games in Florida. That's coming up Monday when I return. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.